Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and we're back with another Z690 uh, memory overclock, but this time it's DDR5 on the Z690 Aorus Tachyon, so the motherboard is of course provided to me by Gigabyte, and the memory kit is a SK Hynix uh, based uh, memory kit from Gigabyte as well, so thank you to Gigabyte for providing the motherboard and RAM, and also for organizing the CPU. Um, so yeah, we're still on the 12900K. I don't have any other 12th gen chips to, uh, to use right now. Um, and this is on the air cooler, which is why I don't have like a nice big set of lin pack, like stable lin pack loops, because this currently overheats, um, because I have it up at six. Uh, so basically, um, I don't know how to, yeah, okay, let, let's do it this way. We're just going to go to the screenshots and we'll sort of go through this. So... And this nice, very stable, I think it's this screenshot, yeah? No, that's 400%. Ah, yes, this is the crazy one. So, this is 1600% uh, <laughs> mem test at 6600, but it's like CL38. So this was like really early baseline testing just to give me myself a reference point of like, this definitely works. Um, and so, yeah, this definitely works. Um, very nice and stable, Runnels Lin Pack, all that good stuff. Now, the, the crazy thing is, um, since 6600 is, like, works great, no, like, absolutely no issues. Getting 6600 stable on the Tachyon is super easy. Funnily enough, uh, 6600 on other motherboards is a pain to even boot. Um, yeah, so, like, which isn't really that surprising. Most of the other motherboards I have have, like, four DIMM slots instead of just two, and four DIMM slots is obviously inferior to two DIMM slots unless you're trying to run a server. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so 6600, super easy to, to, like, boot and, and, like, get stable, um, and you'd think, okay, so if 6600 is so easy to get working, then 6800 can't be that much of a challenge. Well, uh, funnily enough, I haven't had any success whatsoever trying to run the 6800 at all. Like, 6800 is, I get up to 6800, I can't get even, like, 10% mem test. Um, or actually, no, I think I got around to maybe 30% before, like, a flood of errors starts showing up. So, yeah, 68, and that's with, like, loose timings, more voltage than I'm using right now, um, uh, just, like, I tried everything. Just 6800, maybe I suck, maybe it's the memory controller, I haven't gotten, like, I haven't gotten 600, 6800 to be even remotely stable, and honestly, I kind of think it's the actual memory ratio itself, because 6732, which is what we're at right now, isn't really all that different, and yet this is actually stable. Like, it runs Memtest, it runs Y-Cruncher, it doesn't run Linpack, because to get 6732, I'm on the 66x ratio, but with 101 BCLK, which means the CPU is up at 4.88. You know what? I just realized I could have used the 6600 ratio with 102 BCLK, and that would have worked out better on the CPU side of things. I should have probably done that. Um, yeah, because the thing is at 4.85 gigahertz, um, since I'm on the air cooler, at 4.8 gigahertz, the, C the air cooler is like just barely enough to run Linpack. 4.85, it is no longer enough. Um, it overheats, so I can't run Linpack on this currently, but Y-Cruncher has no issues as long as you don't try to run it a bunch of times in a row and then it overwhelms the heatsink, because that's, that's the whole issue. Well, actually, Linpack overheats the heat, like, beats the heatsink in just one pass. Um, so, yeah, it's not, not like I need to run several loops before the air cooler is uh, overwhelmed. Um, but with Y-Cruncher, yeah, as long as you don't try to run it back-to-back, -back, the, the air cooler can just about deal with it, and so I've done a bunch of Y-Cruncher runs, and yeah, it's fine, like, we can just do another one just, you know, um, because that's kind of, like, to me, the definition of stability is you can run arbitrary code with confidence that it won't crash unless the code is actually bad, right? Like, as long as the code is valid, it should not crash or as long as the system doesn't overheat. But I know it'll overheat if I run Linpack, or Prime95 for that matter, um, but Prime95 is not a memory test. So Y-Cruncher uh, uses a lot of RAM. It really hits the memory controller very hard. It doesn't get quite as hot as Linpack, and the purpose of Y-Cruncher and Linpack is from a stability testing perspective is basically the same. They both hit the memory controller really hard. It's just that Linpack is also really hot. Um, so yeah, anyway, 
Um, yeah, runs Y Cruncher, just not back to back. And so, you know, not to like, this is not up to my usual standards of memory overclock stability, but I don't feel too bad about this. Um, right? Like, this, I'd say, is rather stable. Um, this isn't too far off of what I'd be willing to daily. I can't imagine that this is too far from being like, I, I don't think, like, I think really the main issue here is just the CPU cooler. Um, Anyway, so yeah, why Cruncher runs? Um, oh, I guess I should also sh show you the IDA benchmark. Also, it's worth noting that this motherboard doesn't have AVX 512 support, so that's a really nice uh, Y Cruncher run right there, considering that that's just using AVX 256. Uh, here we have the IDA benchmark. The latency tends to float around a bit, but uh, 109 gigabytes read, 104 write, 104 copy. And the thing is, I have a screenshot of similar memory settings getting like 50.6 latency. Um, I don't think we're going to get that because I have, like, hardware info open. Yeah, so now we got 50 point... Actually, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll get lucky and we'll get... Or it'll go up to, like, 54. It sort of floats in that range. Um. Okay, I did not get lucky. I didn't get a 54, though, so not too bad. Um. Anyway... So yeah, that's that's the IDA benchmark right there. I funnily enough, I don't believe I have a like stock um compare like I don't have a stock comparison point for this uh in terms of the memory settings. So I actually don't like I don't know how this compares to like bad DDR5 settings. Though I will say like the stock DDR5 memory timings are really really loose and uh, so I, I'd imagine, like, I wouldn't be surprised if the latency was somewhere in, like, the 60 to 70 nanosecond. Maybe more than that, actually. Like, it's really, like, some of the sub-timings on auto are really, really bad. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Uh, also, what I like about DDR5, especially once you're pushing, like, 6732 at CL32... Uh, the memory, sp like, the memory bandwidth that you get in Memtest, like, so this is 32 gigs of RAM, right? Because these are 16 gig DIMMs. Um, on DDR4, in Memtest, you get, like, for, like, a dual rank 32 gig setup, you're going to be getting maybe, like, 25 gigabytes per second, and that would be really good. Here, we're getting almost 40 gigabytes per second, so this takes significantly less time to run a stress test on the same amount of memory as uh, DDR4 does. So that's really neat. That's that's one thing I really appreciate about DDR5 is just like, okay, it takes less time to run Memtest. Um, it's actually a similar story for like DDR3 versus DDR4. For a given amount of memory capacity, DDR4 is faster to stress test just because it's faster. But uh, yeah, anyway, also ran Geekbench, got 13,448 points. I don't know if that's good. Um, or if it's bad, like, again, I've, you know, I, I've only, well, I've been using the DDR5 to do, like, CPU, well, motherboard and CPU type testing. I've not really uh, been paying attention to, like, the memory itself. So I don't know how this compares to stock. Um, probably pretty well. I can't imagine stock is particularly good. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's the Geekbench 3 score that this gets. And I guess at this point, let's go go into the BIOS and look at the actual settings. Um, anything else I wanted to show? No, there isn't. So, yeah, let's restart. So, it takes a while to boot. That's the one downside I've noticed with DDR5 is the, the, the boot up. Well, it might even be specific to this motherboard, but yeah, it doesn't start the fastest. Especially once you're at these kinds of speeds. Not because it tends to, like, fail memory training very frequently. It just, the, the memory training process takes a while. Um, and I don't have the capture card, I mean, I don't have the camera set up to see the postcode right now. So that's, that's why you get a blank screen like that. Um, anyway. Oh, no. Oh, I didn't do the thing. So there's a bug currently where if you keep mashing the delete key too long, uh, the board bugs out and won't go into the BIOS splash screen, which is super frustrating. And I like, my habit of just mashing delete like a maniac is r very painful right now. Anyway, so internal VCCSA, I have it up at 1.4 volts. 
Um, I wouldn't go above that. I've slightly raised the VCC in. I don't think that necessarily achieved anything, but the thing is the VCC SA rail is generated by an internal voltage regulator inside the CPU. And the integrated voltage regulators from Intel, they need a minimum voltage difference between the voltage they're outputting and the voltage that's coming in to work properly. So I figured maybe slightly by bumping the VCC in might help with stability. It certainly won't harm the CPU in any way. Like, I, w I would imagine even 2 volts would be perfectly fine. It's just that, yeah, no, no real reason to go that high. Um, so yeah, I slightly raised that. I don't think that really achieved anything. Uh, DRAM VDD and VDDQ is set to 1.5 volts, but in the actual DDR5 voltage controls, I have it set to 1.55 for, the, the, for both of these. And the reason I have them bumped up like this is... Uh, because, well, because ultimately this ends up giving us 1.485 volts. Um, and sometimes it hits 1.5 volts, so, yeah. Uh, and I was told by Gigabyte, who provided me with this memory kit, that for long-term use, you don't really want to go above 1.5 volts. For benchmarking, you can go above that, but for, for long-term use, yeah, 1.5 volts is where you'd want to stop. And so 1.55 apparently converts into 1.485 to 1.5 volts, so that's what I went with. Um, yeah, VDD2 CPU is actually handled by the DRAM VDD VDDQ setting, so this being at 1.5 means that if we go over to PC health status, you can see that VDD2 CPU is all the way at 1.55 volts. Okay, I guess that's, that's actually overridden from the DRAM voltage then. Yeah, might be. I wonder about that. I wasn't told specifically what's safe for that part. <laughs> um, so that's the, like... I'm going to have to consult the diagram. I have a, I'm not going to be able to show this to you, I don't think. But I, I was given a diagram of the various Intel CPU voltages, so I'm going to go look, for, find that, because... Yeah, um... I don't remember. Nope, that's not the diagram. That's the diagram. Okay. So, VDD2 goes to the memory controller, I think. Or, I th actually, I think that's... Fe the annoying thing is, like, technically there's a VDDQ voltage in the CPU, and there's a VDD2 voltage also in the CPU. And then there's the VDD and VDDQ voltages that you have on the memory stick, and that's the part where I'm, like, very confused. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's fun. So I wonder if the VDD2 is why it finally stabilized. Because <laughs> it took me a while to, to get the memory settings stable. Um, but other than that, so... Yeah, I might have to do a check on that. Because that might be too high for long-term use, that much VDD2 voltage. Though, then again, like, Intel memory controllers have historically been, well, more recent Intel memory controllers. Like, if you go far back enough, there's some 32 nanometer CPUs where the memory controller is relatively fragile. Um, but, yeah, recent Intel memory controllers have been, like, borderline indestructible, so I don't know that I'd be too on the, like... P, like the part of the memory controller that actually talks to the memory sticks, not the not necessarily the system agent. That's still technically part of the memory controller, but not the same. Um, yeah, you can you can definitely break CPUs with system agent voltage quite well. I don't know if quite easily, but like yeah, I'd be careful with the system agent voltage rail. I wouldn't necessarily be that careful with things like VDD, VDDQ, and VDD2. Actually, VDD and VDDQ would be more, you know, concerning for the memory stick rather than the actual CPU itself. Anyway, so I'll have to, yeah, check check about that, I guess. But um, other than that, I've slightly bumped up the system agent PLL voltage. Um, this is just to help, like, this seems to help a little bit with the memory stability and also the MCPLL uh, voltage, which, again, just seems to help with uh, memory controller stability. The MC literally stands for memory controller. And for these, I would generally stay below plus 200 millivolts. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that, of course, right? And also, there's a sweet spot effect. If you, like, I think, yeah, definitely you can set too much... PLL over voltage, like, I tried to raise the ring PLL by, like, 
I think 120 millivolts. That made it less stable, a lot less stable. So, um, yeah, that is something to keep in mind uh, with those. And also, a lot of the time, they might not actually do anything. So these are sort of like, you know, maybe try go up, going up to like 150 on them. It might help. It prob maybe it won't. Um, now, then we have CPU VRM settings. Nothing all that special here. High LLC, maxed out protections, vCore on extreme. Those are just for the, the core voltage, right? So that's really more about the 4.8 gigahertz on the CPU than it is about the actual memory overclock. And now let's go take a look at the actual memory settings. Uh, oh, yeah. And one thing to note is if you are uh, overclocking DDR5, you need to turn on... Uh, in order to get the full voltage range, you need to turn on the XMP profile. If you don't turn on XMP, uh, like these dims that I have here, these will be limited without XMP to 1.4 volts. Uh, they won't go over that until you turn on XMP. So yeah, that took me way too long to figure out. <laughs> um, so you have to keep the XMP profile, like XMP enabled, even if you aren't actually using it for anything. So yeah, timings, so cast latency 32, it doesn't go lower. Um, and actually the whole reason we're at 6732 is because at 6600, CL30 doesn't work with these dims, not at, not at this voltage. They, maybe with more voltage it would, but again, I, I consider the memory voltage I'm at basically maxed out. Also the dims get pretty warm. Like I have a fan on them and running memtest, they would get up to like 57 degrees Celsius. Um, on an open air test bench. Now that fan isn't running very fast, um, but still like they, they do get really warm. So I wouldn't really run more, more memory voltage than what I'm at right now. Also because Gigabyte straight up told me like, hey, don't, you, like you shouldn't really use more than 1.5 volts for long-term use. So based on that, yeah, um, CL30 didn't work at 6600. And so I was forced to use 32. And then it was like, okay, what's the highest frequency I can do with CL32? Because I the the thing is, you can't, like, CL31 is not a thing in Gear 2, right? You can't have uh, odd uh, cast latency in Gear 2. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's why we're all the way at 6732, is because I can't actually run a lower cast latency at any reasonable frequency. Um, TRCD40 and TRP40... These don't go lower. I tried 39, unstable, 38, uns doesn't work. Um, TRAS, I don't think that is minimized. There's a decent chance that 28 would work. Actually, can I... Oh, oh I don't think they implemented a... Yeah, no. <laughs> I am 99% certain that that register goes minimum to 28, but anyway... Um, yeah, for now I have it at 38, um, so that the TRC can be set to 78, um, and that actually helps, uh, memory performance quite a bit. TCWL at 30, I'm not sure if that might come down more. Uh, I have TWR on auto because the way you set, well, so if you try to set the TWR directly, it bottoms out at 48. Like, you cannot set it below 48, but... What you can do instead is you can leave it on auto and you can adjust the TWR pre, uh, like this timing and that timing, and that'll set the TWR lower instead. Um, and based on some examination of Intel documentation that I've done, it seems to be because the TWR thing, like TWR isn't an actual like timing that Intel has. Um, like, I couldn't find, like, every, basically every timing that there is a register for, you can find in, like, the public documentation for 12th gen CPUs, the second part of that documentation. It'll have a list of all the different available memory registers. Every timing that there's a register for is in there. And so any timing that you see in a BIOS and you can't find a register for it, then it's like, that's because the BIOS, cal like, calculates that timing from other uh, other parameters, and that's basically what's going on with TWR. So my TWR currently is, actually, I think we'll have to go back to the OS for that. Um, so, because it doesn't show up, like, the BIOS doesn't read it out correctly. Like, right now it was saying that it's at 20, but I think it's at 16. So we'll have to go check ASRock Timing Configurator for that. Um... And also, I'm not sure that the TWR is... Well, the thing is, we shouldn't even be talking about TWR based on what I've just said, right? Like, there isn't an actual register for that timing, so... 
it's pointless to discuss it. Actually, like I've, I've been thinking about maybe doing a video about the Intel documentation for 12th gen, but I haven't figured out, like, how I would structure that, especially since I am not that, like, I, I'm bad at memory overclocking. It's like... Uh, yeah, there is not a TWR register. Anyway. So, nope, get out. There we go, let's pull up ASRock Timing Configurator. So, yeah, as you can see... Uh, TWR is 16. Yeah. So that's, that's basically calculated from the other two timings. Um. Also, surprisingly enough, the capture card actually initialized, <laughs> got, got the, got into Windows on its own for once. Okay. So, anyway, so that's why TWR is on auto, because you, you can't actually really set it directly. Uh, TCWL at 30, I don't think it goes any lower, but I've not tried. Uh, TRDS and TRDL are at 4 and 6. I tried 4, 5, and that eventually gets errors in mem test. So, 4, 5 is... Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily impossible to stabilize, but requires more effort than I'm willing to, or, yeah, than, than I've been able to put into it so far. And also maybe more effort than I'm willing to put into it, because the difference between 4.4 four and 4.6 is not really that big. Or even 4.5, like, the di difference between 4.5 and 4.6 is less, like, really not that big, so I can't really be bothered. Um, then TRFC, uh, so if I remember correctly, setting that doesn't work um, currently, or I don't know if it'll ever work. So what I was told to do was just set TRFC2 instead, um, and that then sets the TRFC timing. So TRFC2 at the 300, that might go lower, I've not tried. Uh, and then TRFC uh, per bank is set to 240, which I basically just set off of the fact that TRFC2 on auto would be 480, and then TRFC per bank would be like 390, so I sort of tried to maintain a similar gap, though I guess maybe 200 would have worked as well. Uh, RTP is at 8, and that's, again, like, you know, not setting the RTP timing, that's setting this to 8, so I think that's read pre-charge or something like that, I'd have to check the, um, yeah, I'd have to check the Intel documentation, I'm not gonna do that right now, anyway, um, TFA at 16, um, I think the BIOS might let you set it lower, but that's not, like, yeah, it doesn't work like that. Um, also, well, so basically, so the way the TFA timing works is it limits how many active, like, how many RRDs you can have in a row. Um, so basically, if I only have short, uh, or if I have, like, same group RRD, uh, or activates occur, then it'll be 16. Um, and there's no extra, like, because... I think I've done a video explaining this better. This is an awkward timing to explain, because this is not actually in and of itself a timing. It acts as an extension to the R, like, read... I can't even remember what these stand for. <laughs> this is great. See, I have to look up every... If I, like, any time I want to check that I'm doing something correctly with memory overclocking, I just end up looking up the timing. So, you know, that's fun. Um... Oh man, I'm yeah. Okay, we're just gonna look up RRD because I can't remember off the my off the top of my head. Uh, activate to activate. Okay, it literally is activate to activate. Cool. So anyway, 
The thing is, it basically acts, so the four active window timing acts as an extra delay on top of the activate to activate timings. So, uh, activate's going to the same, ba same bank group? Yes, same bank group. Uh, will take four cycles, and you can do four of them in 16 cycles total. But uh, activates going to a different bank group will take six cycles. Um, and so if you do four of them in a row, those will take 24 cycles. And what the four active window does is if the activates happen in less time than the length of the four active window, it adds a bunch of, like, it adds some delay. Um, so for stability reasons. So, yeah, basically... Um, I could probably achieve the same level of stability as like 4-6 that I have here by running like 4-4 four, four, but with 24 down here. Except 4-4 four, four with 24 down here would actually be slower than having 16 with 4-6 because with a 16, uh, my shortest 4 active window is 16 cycles long and my longest is going to be 24 because that would be uh, 4 activate commands to different groups with each of them going to a different bank group. Um, so, yeah, basically my approach to the four active window timing is just set it to 16, um, always. Because if you, if you need to raise it for any reason, you would probably be better off just raising your RRDs in the first place, right? Like, if you, if you set your T-fall to, like, I don't know, say 60, right? It is functionally the same as if you just set both of these to 15, like, it does the, like, performance-wise, it has this exact same effect. So there's really no reason to ever run a fall that isn't the same or lower than your RRDs. Or really, actually just leaving it at 16 all the time, because, like, the timing just doesn't get used if the RRDs are too long. So, um, yeah, anyway, command rate at 2, TREFI, you can apparently just completely max that out, so that's neat. Um... And uh, then I've already sort of talked about those. TXP is down at four. That can sometimes help with uh, that can help with memory latency a bit. TCKE down at four. Um, what else do we have? And then for tear cherries, we have uh, twelve seven seven. I think eleven might work, but it also wouldn't necessarily make that much of a difference. Less than seven doesn't. Like trying to set like twelve six, that's not gonna work. Um, I've tried. Um, then these two, also I have a bunch of these that could actually be on auto, like all the DR and like underscore DR and DD timings, this is a single rank memory setup right now, so the DR and DD timings don't apply because those are used for different rank in the same memory channel and different dim in the same memory channel. Um, but I just have them set to something so that, you know, it doesn't look weird. Like technically I could have them set to one, it wouldn't, oh it won't let me. Okay, well I could have them set to four. And it wouldn't really make a difference because they're not currently being used because the, the like the what those timings are for is physically not present in the system, right? Um, so anyway, uh, then we have the read to writes, which uh, might go. Actually, no, I think I tried sixteen and it won't post. Um, I didn't try seventeen, but I don't really think that's worth worth the effort. Like it probably won't post, and if it does, it might be really unstable. And at, at this point, I don't feel like checking. Uh, Right to right, same group is at 14. 12 might work. This timing's weird because on auto, it's super loose. Like on auto, it goes to like 34 or even higher. Actually, I think on auto, it might've been like 50 at 6,600. So yeah, um, but you also can't, like I don't think uh, you can run it at 12. Um, anyway, these two are basically as low as they go, I think as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I tried 44 for right to write, uh, right to read different group and that didn't work. And I'm also pretty sure that I tried right to read, uh, same group at 60 and that also didn't work. So yeah. Anyway, uh, what else do we have? Right. And then RTLs, unfortunately, if you try to set these right now, uh, it doesn't work because uh, you need to set the RTLs uh, for both sub channels on each memory stick. Like uh, you need to set the RTLs for the sub channels on the on the channel and uh, you don't actually have the options for that currently. So if I try to lock the RTLs, um, that doesn't work right now because technically, like the BIOS shows that the RTLs are 68 and 66, but they're actually not. 
Um, if we go back into Azrock Timing Configurator, I think they're like 69, 68, and then 67, 66. Um, and so you can't currently set that because the BIOS doesn't have the necessary uh, options for that. So, like, the reason you'd want to lock in the RTLs is potentially if you're having, like, issues where sometimes it boots and the RTLs are just completely wrong uh, to avoid that. But I've also not had that happen yet, so I don't really see a reason to do that. Uh, like, I've not had the board train incorrect RTLs at this speed. I think maybe up at 7,000 it might be doing it, but I've not really tested up at 7,000 very much because even at 6,800, stability is basically impossible for me to achieve. So, yeah, um, that's kind of it for this video, I think. Um, definitely, like, I am not finished with this or... Well, yeah, I'm not finished with this, but this is sort of like a first first attempt. Like, at this point, basically, I need to try a different motherboard, see how that behaves. Um, and by different motherboard, I mean the Apex. Um, see what I can do there. And then if that doesn't really yield any significantly different results, then I'm going to come to the conclusion that this is actually just fine, and this, this is just kind of where the CPU and this memory kit top out. Um... And, uh, yeah, but, like, DDR5 is, v well, pretty, like, rather different from DDR4. Um, and, um, uh, yeah. So, also, I think definitely there's some time, well, okay, cast latency is minimized. TRCD and TRP are minimized. TRAS, as I mentioned, isn't. TRC I isn't because TRAS isn't. Um, TRC is basically, like, your TRC should basically be equal to your TRP to plus TRAS. Um, also, technically, TRP is now a separate register from TRC, TRCD, though I think Gigabyte currently overrides the TRP value. Actually, we can check that. See what happens. So yeah, definitely some, you know, like there's, I still, definitely still room for improvement, but th this is sort of the first, first not no effort memory overclock that I got working. So I figured I'd make a video about it because the no effort one is 6,600. With the Tachyon at 6,600, it's ridiculously easy. Like you basically don't have to do anything. Like I did, like the reason, like at 6,600, I didn't even realize that you needed to have XMP turned on to get like extra voltage range on the dims. Um, and I think it was still doing like CL36 or 34 or something. Um, obviously the screenshot I showed, oh, I did the thing. I, I did the thing where I hit the delete key too many times and so it won't initialize the BIOS. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, like, I realized that the screenshot I showed of the 6600 settings was CL38, but later on I also did some runs at, like, 34 and 36, and I think 36 was stable. Um, so, yeah, and that was just with 1.4 volts memory voltage. I think one point, I think it was also 1.4 VDD. Oh, did I do it again? No, Okay. <laughs> Capture card being weird. This is real. The capture card's really not helping. Um, so what I wanted to check is, yeah, so Gigabyte does this as well. Um, MSI does this also. Um, so the thing is, on older platforms like Z590 and Z490 and all the way back to like Z170, uh, Intel had one register for both TRCD and TRP. So you couldn't set TRCD and TRP separately. You couldn't do that. But now with Z690, uh, there is actually a separate TRP register. And for whatever reason, uh, I don't think anybody, maybe ASRock, I don't, I've not used an ASRock board, but so far, like the only motherboards where you can set TRP, sep like actually control the TRP register, in my experience, is Asus boards. Um, so that's pretty frustrating if you think about it. Uh, Though, at the same time, the TRP timing is a timing that I've not really noticed have much impact on performance, but even then, it's just kind of like, like, it should be controllable. Like, I, I don't know why it isn't. But, th like, both the MSI and the all the Gigabyte boards I have do this, where it's like, you try to set the TRP and it just gets set to whatever the TRCD value is. So, 
Yeah. Um, I guess I'll point that out to them, that technically, like, TRP should be separated, because, yeah, it's, it's no longer part of the TRCD setting. Um, anyway, um, so I guess that'll be interesting on the Apex to see how low I can push the TRP, though. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, and if it, if it even makes a difference. <laughs> that's the other thing to check. But, um, yeah. So, that's it for this video. Hopefully this is somewhat helpful for your own... Well, actually, it probably isn't, because you probably don't have a tachyon. And on the, like, four dimmer boards, things are very different. Like, on the four dim motherboards going over 6400... Actually, four dim six layer, so, like, the, the cheapest DDR5 board I have, I can't even really go over 6000. Um... And then once you get up to, like, the 4DIM 8-layer boards, those all seem to just sort of, like, well, okay, it's not... I didn't really try pushing them past 6400 very hard, but on the Tachyon, within, like, 30 minutes, I accidentally booted 7000. And I know that sounds insane, but it was actually accidental. I got up to 7000 basically by accident. I didn't even realize I was trying to boot 7000 until until I got into the BIOS, looked at the memory speed, and I was like, it says 7000, I don't remember. And then, then I realized I had the DDR5 auto booster enabled. And as far as I can tell, that setting basically gives you plus 200, like, yeah, plus 200 megabits per second memory speed. So that was really fun because it was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Um, but on the four dimmers, uh, well, you're not accidentally booting 7,000, I can tell you that much. Because, honestly, I've not been able to accidentally boot 6,600 on those. So, uh, yeah, um, the, the, the Tachyon, uh, so basically, if you have a four, like, obviously I'll do some overclocking on the four, four dim boards as well, eventually. Um, but... Yeah, for now, the, the Tachyon's the only board that I've really spent a lot of time with, DDR5. Um, and so n next I want to test the Apex, because obviously I, I want a reference, like, comparison points. Because I, I don't know if the CPU... Like, I, th I think the reason I can't do 6800 is the CPU. Um, if I hit a similar brick wall on the Apex, I'm going to be more certain of that. Though, obviously, that doesn't rule out the possibility that maybe I just suck at memory overclocking, which is a very real possibility, <laughs> so... Anyway, um, there, that's actually it for the video at this point. Um, and hopefully it's somewhat helpful. Like, if, if you have a SK Inix memory kit and a Tachyon, I guess. Um, at the very least, it might give you some idea of what's possible if you get this kind of hardware. Um... And, uh, yeah, so that's it. Thank you to Gigabyte, again, for providing the motherboard and the CPU and the memory kit. And, uh, that, and thanks to you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, hoodies, you know, the usual YouTuber merch, uh, both Patreon... Uh, and Teespring help out immensely with running the channel, so it'd be much appreciated if you check them out. And that's it for the video, so thanks for watching, and goodbye!